Hello. Welcome to Mad Times with Madison. Formally, if you haven't heard, almost a true crime podcast. I am going solo because Taryn decided it just wasn't for her. So you will be getting true crime twice a week from just me. Every Wednesday will stay exactly the same. You'll get a free episode here. And then every Friday on the Patreon, you'll have different tiers if you would like to support me. With different things that you get, there will be a um, new episode every Friday for those who pay. They might be a little shorter just because we had like designed them to be shorter, but they were sort of long with our banter and things like that. But with it just being me and me having to do eight cases a month, they might just be a little shorter, but you will get them. And I'm also trying something new. I don't know if it will have loaded yet. So you might have already seen it, might not. There is a way to subscribe to the bonus episodes. Here goes my cat. The bonus episodes through Apple Podcasts. So you don't have to go through Patreon at all. It'll be a flat monthly fee. And I'm not exactly sure how it works. It will come out of however you pay for your Apple subscriptions. And then they'll be right in your feed. So that's kind of fun and exciting and new. But like I said, I don't know if it's up yet. I'm recording this on Tuesday the day before, so not quite sure. So no intro music yet, but there will be some, and we can just get started, I guess. You already know who I am, what I'm about. Don't feel the need to reintroduce myself, but I hope you come along for the ride with me. I'm kind of excited about this. I do miss Taryn, and I think it is going to be very weird doing this without her. I mean, it's it was weird coming home knowing I had to record And I could just go upstairs and record because I wasn't, like, waiting for her. That was weird to me. So stick with me while I work out all the kinks, get all my stuff ready to go, and I love you. Thank you. So I am doing the case of Patricia Stallings, and a lot of this comes from Unsolved Mysteries Wiki, which is weird because it's not actually unsolved anymore, but that's where a lot of this comes from. Also, I'm in my room. Like I said, we moved recording upstairs right before we quit everything (laughs) and my cat loves it in here and she's a tiny menace I don't know if you can hear her bell do not go over don't go over there okay so Patricia Stallings lived in Jefferson County Missouri and was a convenience store clerk in the mid-1980s David Stallings frequently came into her store and then they began to date in 1986 they got married in 1988 and had their first son Ryan who was born in April of 1989 On July 9th, 1989, 24-year-old Patricia Stallings rushed her critically ill three-month-old son, Ryan, to Cardinal Glennon Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. They were from nearby Jefferson County. Since his birth, he had suffered chronic gastric distress. On the day he was brought to the emergency room, his breathing became extremely labored, and he was vomiting uncontrollably. She was originally planning to go to her doctor at St. Louis Children's Hospital, but in a panic, she accidentally turned off the freeway too early and went to Cardinal Glennon instead. Ryan was immediately placed in the pediatric intensive care unit. He was hooked up to a respirator and had various tubes placed in him. By that point, he was listless. He was almost comatose. He was still throwing up everywhere. Patricia and her husband, David, were told by doctors that they did not know at all what was wrong with him and would not know how long he would have to be there. They were told to go to the waiting room and wait until doctors could figure out what was wrong. She said um, it was just a shock to see a little baby incapacitated the way he was. It was to the point where they said, well, they don't know how long he's going to be here. We don't know what's wrong with him yet. So you may as well just go into the waiting room and stay out there until we can tell you what's wrong. They rented a room at the hospital to be close to him. A complete medical examination was done to him, which included blood and urine tests. Well, they got their answer after three long days, and it was truly baffling. It appeared as though three-month-old Ryan was poisoned. Lab tests, which included the use of gas chromatography machine, showed that he had ethylene glycol and acetone in his body. Ethylene glycol is a colorless, sweet-tasting substance, like we know from a case we just did. It's normally found in radiator antifreeze, industrial solvents, and resins. It can be fatal in large enough doses. Acetone is fingernail polish remover. So the doctors are being polite at first, and Dave and Patty did say that they had both of those items in their house, but they weren't sure at all how Ryan would have gotten into them. But the police are obviously suspicious. So they weren't allowed to be with Ryan alone, and they alerted the sheriff's department and family services. 
That same day, detectives were brought into question David and Patricia separately. They asked Patricia if there were any fights or any other problems at home. And they basically told her that they know that either her or David poisoned Ryan. She was super pissed. She denied poisoning Ryan. She's like, I don't know why you think I would do that. That doesn't make any sense. Ryan's condition improved. After 12 days, he was released from the hospital, but not back to Dave and Patricia. Instead, he was given to a social worker who informed them that she would be taking custody of him and placing him with foster parents. David was extremely angry and asked why she was doing that. She said that it was a policy for them to take children from their parents when a suspected poisoning occurs. Which is just so crazy to me that this appears to happen often enough that they have a procedure for children poisonings. That's concerning. So, David and Patricia's contact with Ryan was severely restricted. They were allowed only a one-hour visit each week on Thursdays. It sucked, but they said they made the most of it. Ryan was always happy to see them. They were always happy to see him. They did that for five weeks. They had supervised visits. During the sixth visit on August 31st, Patricia was left alone with him for a short time. Well, three days later, he suffered another severe attack of vomiting. Once again, he was rushed to Cardinal Glennon Hospital. And once again, the diagnosis was poisoning. This time, even higher levels of ethylene glycol were found in his blood. So there's even more now. So they are not fucking around. At the hospital, a detective was waiting for them and arrested Patricia at the hospital for assault for poisoning Ryan. Patricia, again, denied poisoning Ryan and figured out whatever the truth was would come out soon anyway. She's, like, not very worried about it. She's like, I, I did not do it, so they're going to figure out what happened anyway. Meanwhile, doctors told David that they did not think Ryan was going to survive this time and told him to prepare for Ryan's death, basically. So a priest came and baptized Ryan and gave him his last rites. And this whole time, David is like begging for Patricia to be let out of jail so she can say goodbye to Ryan. And they would not let her. She did not get to say goodbye to her son, Ryan. Doctors then asked him if Ryan could be removed from life support, and he tearfully agreed. For three hours, he held him as he slowly slipped away. In September 1989, at 6.30 p.m., one of the doctors shut off the machine to monitor his heart rate. He was pronounced dead soon after. He was not even six months old yet. At 9 p.m., Patricia received a call in jail from David who told her that Ryan had died. He was allowed to visit her that night. After Ryan's death, her charges were upgraded to first-degree murder. She was held without bail, and she was also not allowed to attend his funeral. Well, a few weeks later, Patricia finds out that she is pregnant again. On February 27, 1990, David Stallings Jr., DJ, was born at Madison County Hospital, which is always so weird to me when the second son is named after the dad that's just why not the first what why not the first one he was one month premature even though david was not a suspect and had been charged with no crime at all he was not allowed to take dj home with him he became a ward of the state and was placed in foster care when dj was two weeks old he was rushed to st louis children's hospital after he began to exhibit symptoms identical to the ones that had When DJ was two weeks old, he was rushed to St. Louis Children's Hospital after he began to exhibit the same exact symptoms as his brother, Ryan. Within a month, the hospital diagnosed his illness as a rare genetic disorder, methylmalonic acidemia, or MMA. This inhibits the body's ability to process food, especially protein. It causes the body to produce chemical byproducts that may be remarkably similar to the ethylene glycol found in antifreeze, It is a very, very rare disease, especially at this level. However, in a strange twist, the medical revelation was not allowed to be presented at her trial for Ryan's murder. The judge and four expert witnesses claimed that whatever disease DJ had had nothing to do with why Ryan died because Ryan was poisoned because of the ethylene glycol found in his system. And there was some crystallization on his brain that is consistent with antifreeze poisoning. Now, MMA is very rare. Like I said, it's often misdiagnosed because it looks so much like ethylene glycol, but it is not. It's crazy similar. And they're saying, like, this isn't relevant. This isn't relevant to what you have going on, which is just wild. In January 1991, Patricia's trial began. Without the medical testimony, this case against her seemed virtually airtight. Police and social workers testified that she showed little emotion upon learning of Ryan's death which isn't really fair because she was in prison when she learned of Ryan's death. She already isn't herself. 
Two bottles of antifreeze were found in the Stallings home. One was half empty. Another son of Patricia's was in her sister's custody because of allegations of abuse. The prosecution focused on the events of Thursday, August 31st. The prosecution focused on the events of Thursday, August 31st, 1989, her and David's sixth parental visit with Ryan. On that visit, David's parents were invited for the first time. About 20 minutes into it, they decided to leave and let him and Patricia spend the rest of the time alone with Ryan. He then escorted them out of the room and down the hall. He was gone for no more than 45 seconds. However, prosecuting attorney McElroy claims that during the visit, Patricia was left alone with Ryan between three and eight minutes, which is a huge difference. During that time, she fed him a bottle. After he was taken to the hospital and diagnosed with poisoning again, several bottles were examined for possible traces of poison. All of them tested negative except for one. This was the one that she fed him with. It contained trace amounts of ethylene glycol. It had actually been prepared by the foster mother and retrieved from the diaper bag during the visit. So it's not like she made this bottle or anything like that. It was like given to her ready to go. McElroy believes and circumstantial evidence suggests that she slipped ethylene glycol or antifreeze into the bottle during the feeding. McElroy claims that Patricia started feeding Ryan at the beginning of the visit. David, however, states that she did not feed him until about halfway into the visit when he started to get fussy. David claims to have gotten the bottle from the diaper bag, so he got the bottle from the diaper bag. He did not smell anything or see any discoloration in it. It was clear to him that nothing had been done to the bottle, is basically what he's saying. It's like It just looked completely normal, and I got it. According to Patricia's lawyers, Ryan's symptoms did not appear until three and a half days after the visit. Cedarbaum does not believe that it would take 80 hours for ethylene glycol to cause symptoms in him. He believes it would have happened a lot faster than that. So what they're saying there is basically, like, if he was poisoned he wouldn't have exhibited the symptoms of a poisoning three days later. That's something that happens with this rare disease. According to McElroy, Ryan was taken from the visit by a DFS worker to the foster parent's home, but early the next morning, he was taken to a home of a temporary foster parent who kept him for just over the weekend. He believes that they, not knowing what Ryan was like, may have overlooked symptoms that the first set would have seen. Which makes sense. You don't ingest a ton of antifreeze and then like I said, die three full days later. So the prosecutor is trying to say, well, after that visit, he spent the weekend somewhere else and they may not have known he was sick because they're not that familiar with him. Like they may not have noticed like little nuances here and there that someone who spends every day with someone would have noticed. It seemed from the beginning that the key to Patricia's defense was to somehow show that Ryan's death may have been caused by MMA and that he was not poisoned at all, much less by his mother. Rathbone, who said he had agreed to take her case as a favor to the family because, quote, it seemed like nobody else would take it said he hoped to prove that the infant had died of a metabolic disorder. He said the problem is that there was no one who would back me up on it. He did extensive reading on the subject and even spoke to a nationally known expert on metabolic diseases. That expert, he said, told him there was no way that any metabolic byproducts of MMA could be mistaken for ethylene glycol and lab tests. Rathbone, who said he has a degree in biochemistry, said he also looked at the test results of SmithKline and St. Louis University and determined that there was no reason for him to question their findings. He said, I went back to my old textbooks to make sure. By the opening day of the trial, Rathbone had subpoenaed no expert witnesses to testify for Patricia. He said he believed none was available. Rathbone also did not take depositions of any of the state's expert medical witnesses. He said that after the trial, he had no reason not to trust their findings, which was like fucked up because I'm hiring you to like not trust their findings. So that's great. McElroy told the jury, don't speculate that five-month-old Brian Stallings died of natural causes. He said, you might as well speculate that some little man from Mars came down and shot him full of some mysterious bacteria. Don't try to understand why Patricia Stallings poisoned her child by feeding him from a baby bottle laced with antifreeze. He said, the point is that she did it, only she could have done it, and only she would have done it. Which is just like a bold statement to make because you have looked nowhere else. On January 31st, after deliberating for 10 hours, a jury found Patricia guilty of first-degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon. On March 4th, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. David collapsed from shock after the verdict was read and had to be rushed to the hospital. She has only seen DJ three times at this point, twice just after he was born, and a third time when he was a week old. So she has barely even seen her only surviving child at this point. So, this case aired on Unsolved Mysteries on May 8th, 1991, and after it aired, a whole bunch of physicians who were very familiar with MMA called in. 
One of them was William Sly, chairman of the biochemistry department at St. Louis University. He and James Shoemaker, director of the university's metabolic screening laboratory, believed that Ryan may have died from MMA. Shoemaker tested frozen samples of his blood serum. He used a gas chromatography machine and found propionic acid in his blood, not ethylene glycol. The acid is normally found in patients with MMA. He noted that the two substances create similar results, which may have led to the previous misidentifications. In fact, the difference between them is just a few carbon atoms. He also sent test samples of blood spiked with propionic acid to seven other labs to see if they would misidentify it as ethylene glycol, and three of them did. So he's saying it is entirely possible to mistake this disease for antifreeze because I know it's not, and three other people made the same mistake that you did. Patricia's new attorneys, led by Robert Ritter, petitioned the court to grant her another trial based on the fact that she had previously received ineffective counsel from Rathbone, her former lawyer. Surprisingly, McElroy agreed that Rathbone's defense had been ineffective. On July 30th, 1991, she was granted a new trial and released from prison. To sort through the scientific inconsistencies, prosecutors contacted Dr. Piero Ronaldo, assistant professor of genetics at Yale, and had him look into the case. He spent several weeks reviewing the laboratory evidence He determined that the original lab results were grossly inaccurate, finding major errors in both sets of findings. He agreed that the results of the gas chromatography machine and the mass spectrometer did not show ethylene glycol. Ronaldo said the quality of the test was totally unacceptable. They were, he said, unbelievable out of this world. I was astonished. I couldn't believe that somebody would let this go through a criminal trial unchallenged. In independent tests, Ronaldo said he found no evidence of ethylene glycol in Ryan's blood. He also said he could find no evidence in test results done on the baby bottle that any ethylene glycol had been found there. Even further, Ronaldo said that Cardinal Glenn's non-treatment of Ryan's treatment that included fasting and use of ethanol to limit the effects of ethylene glycol poisoning were inappropriate for a child with MMA. On September 20th, a press conference was held in St. Louis. At the conference, Ronaldo revealed that the independent blood serum test showed Ryan had MMA and had definitely died from it. Consequently, the prosecuting attorney dropped all charges against Patricia. McElroy also personally apologized to them for their ordeal. During the conference, David and Patricia heard for the first time that custody of DJ had been returned to them. Scientists believe that some of the traces of ethylene glycol found in previous tests were actually caused by a sterilization process used to draw blood for the tests. They also believe that the process of washing Ryan's bottle caused false ethylene glycol readings. Furthermore, the crystals found in his brain are believed to have been caused by an ethanol drip given to him after the suspected poisoning. Patricia said after spending years in jail for a crime she didn't commit, she never fully got to grieve Ryan and sometimes just literally doesn't believe he's not here anymore. She said she had to, like, refuse to think about it because she needed to stay strong in prison to get out so she could take care of her other son. She later said that the perception of her case may have been influenced by the case of Paula Sims, who had which had unfolded around the same time. In that case, a mother had been tried and convicted of killing her two daughters, and there was a considerable public outcry over the murders, which is just, it's, it's a bizarre case. I'll have to do it. David and Patricia later sued Cardinal Glennon Hospital, St. Louis University Hospital, the doctors, and Smith Klein Beecham Clinic Laboratories, who were all involved with incorrectly diagnosing Ryan with ethylene glycol poisoning. They claim that the hospitals refused to perform additional testing even after DJ was diagnosed with MMA. In 1992, Cardinal Glennon, St. Louis University, and the doctors settled out of court. In 1993, they settled a lawsuit with Smith Klein. In total, they were awarded several million dollars. And then Patricia and David did end up divorcing later on, which is sad. In 1994, McElroy ran for re-election as Jefferson County Prosecutor, and Patricia donated $10,000 to his opponent, Robert Wilkins. Wilkins ended up winning the race, which is cool. When McElroy offered to show Wilkins his information on the Stallings case, Patricia found out and asked the court to have her arrest record expunged. Some of the information was ordered to be expunged, but a judge said that Missouri law mandated that prosecutors confidentially maintain some of the information related to felony arrests. After she donated $10,000 to his opponent, McElroy said, I can appreciate her grief and anger. I just feel that her anger is misdirected. Patricia has helped collect several thousand more dollars for Wilkins, bringing his campaign contributions to $23,000 compared to McElroy's $8,000. So she really helped him a lot. 
Stallings case continues to be cited as an extreme case of a metabolic disorder that mimics a criminal act. Tragically, DJ passed away on September 17, 2013 at the age of 23. David also passed away on April 30, 2019 at the age of 57 following a lengthy illness. His obituary donation cause was Alzheimer's, so I'm wondering if he had that. He was survived by four other children and one grandson. I also can't um, figure out what DJ died from. I tried looking and I couldn't really find it. But that is the insane case of a mother who was arrested for poisoning her children who just ended up having a super rare disease that mimicked being poisoned. And I'm sorry this was so short. These are cases that I had already researched and typed up when I was doing it with Taryn. So it was okay if they were a little short because we talk a lot, but we're not talking at all anymore. So I am starting, ooh, sorry, Harvey. I am starting a bunch of new cases that will be a little longer, but these few might be a little short, and I am sorry for that. But I got to get through them because I thought they were very interesting. Um, You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Mad Times with Madison if you want to follow along. Like I said, subscribing on Patreon or that Apple podcast if it's up yet is extremely helpful. It's how I keep this thing going. And I would really appreciate it. And you get a bonus episode every week. And the episode I have for this Friday is really crazy, actually. And that's all. No outro music, no nothing. So (laughs) this is just going to be literal bare bones for a while. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too weird with just me. I actually felt okay recording it. I usually feel very awkward recording alone. And I kind of thought I'm just sitting in my room in my little chair alone. And it was kind of nice. It would be a lot nicer if I wasn't alone anymore, but this is what we're working with. And I hope you stick around. And if you do, thank you. And if you are subscribing, I'll see you Friday. And if you're not, I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Bye.